Hey there once again YouTube. Now this video might be pretty long for you so if it is please use the parts section in the description box below to skip to a certain part of interest if you wish. And a lot of people are probably going to have to use the description box and the parts section down there so go check that out if you want. First off, let's go to the past 7 days magnitudes 2.5 and above. You will see there's been a lot of seismicity in Kansas as of late and we've already seen two magnitude 4 and above in less than a week, actually, in the past two days, we saw 4.1 earlier today, which I'll look at in just a second. And the magnitude 4.2 at 5 kilometers in depth, which occurred during a 20-hour increase in seismicity for North America. Uh, it's kind of an increase in seismicity. Mainly there, it was an increase in magnitude 4 events around the United States and Canada. Now, I will talk about this one, the 4.2 that occurred two days ago. I'll talk about that in my blog post that I'm going to share with you guys in just a second. But let's go to the most recent event, which was a magnitude 4.1 again at 5 kilometers in depth. Basically in the same area as the other magnitude 4.2. Over 555 people felt this event. Remember, this is just the number of people who reported feeling it. A lot of seismicity going on in Kansas right now in Oklahoma, which a lot of it has to do with fracking. A lot of it does. I'm not saying every earthquake is fracking because obviously that's impossible. Not every single earthquake can be directly caused by fracking and wastewater injection, but a lot, a lot of them in this area are. And even the USGS has admitted that before. <clears throat> so, let's take station N4, or excuse me, station R32B in the N4 network just real quick. Here we have R32B in the N4 network, broadband vertical channel. I'm going to add a 1 hertz high pass filter to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. And down here we do see the magnitude 4.1, which is the second magnitude 4 and above in the past two days for South Hutchinson, Kansas. Very interesting activity that is taking place there right now. Some very strong lower frequencies. Of course, this is a regular high frequency earthquake, but we still do see... Now, there's a difference between a low frequency earthquake and an earthquake with dominant low frequencies. Totally two different things. A low frequency earthquake usually will not have any power at all beyond 10 hertz at all. But uh, an earthquake with dominant lower frequencies can have high range frequencies going to whatever frequency, but can still have the strongest frequencies in the lower frequency band. I know I'm saying frequency a lot. Sorry. <laughs> but again, here's the magnitude 4.1 in Kansas from the closest seismic station available. Looks just like the original 4.2, which we'll talk about in just a second. Right here, you will see another event. Kind of looks like a low frequency event, doesn't it? But it is not. This is the magnitude 3.7 right here which occurred in Oklahoma at about 9.07 UTC. Remember, it takes about a minute to travel to the station. There's 9.08 UTC right there. So this is the event right there. It's a 3.7 at 16.1 kilometers in depth in Oklahoma. This one is not caused by fracking. Look at the depth. That is way too deep for an earthquake to be caused by fracking. That is really, really deep, guys. I mean, I, I think probably maybe 5 to 10 kilometers, maybe 12 kilometers at the maximum, but 16.1 kilometers, eh, I don't know. But the Kansas quakes, I do believe, could be related to fracking, in my opinion. Wastewater injection. But again, we see the magnitude 4.1 in Kansas. Again. So, I'm going to go move on to the pond of water that is growing at Kilauea. Here we are at US, volcanoes.usgs.gov at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory Volcano Watch Articles. I'm going to leave a link to this article in the description box below, but you can also keep an eye on it if you go to my recent blog post in my Seismal blog, which I will get into in just a minute. Now, what does water in Halimama mean? Halimama crater is inside Kilauea Caldera, just saying. These images look east at the pond within Halimama on August 8th and August 14th. The pond widened mainly toward the south, right? The north-south width of the pond on August 14th was about 32 meters or 105 feet about 35 feet wider than on August 8th. The pond has widened and deepened slowly and steadily since measurements began on August 3rd. And you can see right here, look at that guys, it definitely has gotten bigger and deeper. So, very, very intriguing. Now, they do say that circumstantial evidence is starting to point towards groundwater, which they were hoping it was rainwater, but it's starting to look like this is definitely groundwater. Now, it is rising slowly and steadily, almost constantly, right? But there has been insufficient rainfall since July 25th, when this was discovered, to account for the constant rise. I mean, maybe it'd rise here and there a little bit, but it's been literally constantly rising with the lack of rainfall, so 
That's one aspect of this whole situation that makes me think that it is groundwater. And USGS is starting to lean towards the fact, yes, it could be groundwater. The slowly deepening pond of water on the floor of Holly Mau Mau, the first in recorded history, has captured the interest of the media and the public, both locally and nationally. Many questions are being asked. The two most frequent are, where is the water coming from, and what is its importance? Two potential sources of water are recent rainfall and groundwater. At this writing, either remains a possibility. And that's very true. That's very true. Circumstantial evidence, however, favors groundwater. The local water table below which rocks are saturated with water is at an elevation of about 1,936 feet. As measured in a deep hole drilled in 1973, about half a mile south of Hali Mau Mau. The elevation of the floor of Hali Mau Mau is about 1,706 feet, about 230 feet lower than the nearby water table. So you'd think that maybe some water is definitely intruding from the groundwater table. Before the 2018 collapse of Kilauea the volcano summit, geophysical data suggested that the water table near Hali Mau Mau was at about the same elevation as in the drill hole, but it was apparently drawn down during the collapse. The water table is likely recovering now, and as it rises, water inundates low areas such as the crater floor. Remember guys, one of the reasons for the explosive ash eruptions at Kilauea Caldera during 2018 was from magma encountering groundwater. That was one of the reasons why it had such, exp uh, over 64, I believe it was 66, 64 or 66 explosive ash eruptions in 2018. So far, the surface of the pond is rising slowly and steadily consistent with the rising water table. The pond level should rise in jumps during downpours if rain is directly responsible for feeding it. I do have to say, however, though, even if rain is, let's say there's a huge rainstorm, right? It's still going to add to the water that's down there, right? I mean, so a jump doesn't necessarily mean it's only rainwater, right? Obviously, if there's a heavy rainfall, you're going to see a little bit of uh, adage to that water table. Unfortunately, Hali Mau Mau has experienced no heavy rain since the pond was first observed on July 25th, 2019, which makes me think that this is definitely groundwater. It would be best to sample the water and date it using isotropic means. The rain would have today's age and groundwater would have an older age. How deep is the water? In the surface pond, no more than a couple of meters, yards, but the visible pond could be just the top of the saturated zone, which could conceivably be ten several tens of meters deep. There's probably a bottom to the standing water because heat in the plugged magma conduit below the floor of Hali Mau Mau would boil away water at some depth. But as the conduit cools, the floor of standing water would move downward, deepening the water body from below as well as at the surface. This may seem academic, but the total thickness of the water body impacts potential hazards. A mere puddle would scarcely affect the next summit eruption. But... If rising magma had to penetrate several tens of meters, yards, of water, an explosive scenario that has played out in the past could repeat. Given a thick water body, the rate at which magma rises through the water becomes crucial. Slowly rising magma would simply evaporate the water and emerge on the surface as a lava flow or eventually form a lava lake. Magma that rises rapidly does so because it is being powered by expanding gas bubbles within it. A classic example is a lava fountain, which is already fragmenting because of gas expansion before it even reaches the surface. If such rapidly rising fragmenting magma meets water, the fragments transfer heat to the water far more efficiently than a continuous surface of magma, as with slowly rising magma. The result is that the water rapidly boils, creating steam that expands and adds to the explosive energy of what would be a lava fountain under dry conditions. Uh, causing an ash eruption. We are quite, quite sure that this kind of explosion has happened repeatedly in Kilauea's past. So this is just part of the ongoing cycle of Kilauea, guys. Maybe it subsides, erupts in the Lower East Rift Zone, magma fills back up, the water table comes back, a pond of water is created, then the magma starts to intrude in the water table, cause explosive eruptions, and then eventually lava comes, fills a lava lake, the lava lake sits there for decades and decades and decades, and then all of a sudden it collapses again and redoes that the whole cycle all over again. We are quite sure that this kind of explosion has happened repeatedly in Kilauea's past. Detailed study of textures of glass fragments and deposits some 400 years old provide evidence of water quenching. Chemical analysis of this glass showed that the amount of dissolved water and sulfur is intermediate between that of magma before the eruption and that in lava fountains. 
the result of water quenching the magma before most of the gas could escape. If the water body is thin, even rapidly rising magma would not create large explosions because of the small amount of steam in general. If, however, the water is several tens of meters deep, locally powerful explosions could ensue, probably not large enough to diminish public safety, but perhaps big enough to create a nuisance asphalt during unfavorable wind direction. We have no way to anticipate when magma will begin to rise at the Halimama conduit, much less if the rate of rise will be slow or fast. At present, monitoring data shows no sign of impending eruption, and it could be years down the road before the next summit eruption happens. Wow, guys, that was a very, very intriguing article. Thank you, HBO, for putting that out. That was pretty crazy, guys. So, I think this could lead to an explosive eruption. I think it's groundwater, and I think it's deep. If it's rainwater, which I doubt it is, it could be very thin. If it's groundwater, it's likely pretty deep. So it all depends on what goes on. And this has happened in the past. Very interesting. Here you are at my Seismo blog, which with my most recent post. I know I don't post much on my Seismo blog much anymore, but we do have Seismic blogs right here. And all my Seismic blogs that I do post stuff on every now and then with the most used all the way at the top and the least used all the way at the bottom. So. Let's look at the most recent post about the strange burst of seismicity within 20 hours. I will leave a link to this in the description box below if you don't want to follow through this video, but if you do, just keep watching. On August 15, 2019, at 1946 UTC, a magnitude 3.5 earthquake struck the southern border of Yellowstone National Park. This was the start of a 20-hour period of increasing seismicity for the United States and Canada. It was the largest earthquake to strike Yellowstone in just over two years and was detected on seismic stations hundreds of miles away. During this time frame, about four and a half hours after the 3.5 at Yellowstone, a magnitude 4.2 struck Manhattan, Montana, including multiple force shocks leading up to the 4.2. About two and a half hours later, a strange magnitude 4.1 struck in an odd location in southeast Saskatchewan, Canada. Then, about ten and a half hours later, a strong magnitude 4.2 struck South, Hut excuse me, South Hutchinson, Kansas. Finally, the seismicity calmed after a magnitude 5.4 struck off the coast of Oregon along the Blanco Fracture Zone, approximately 2 hours and 23 minutes after the 4.2 in Kansas. All of these events can be seen on the helicopter right here, which is from station YHH at Yellowstone. So what caused this apparent increase in seismicity? North America was somewhat calm prior to this, except for the occasional magnitude 3 or so in California. So, were all of these just a coincidence? It's up to you, seeing that I don't have the answer for that. I will, however, show some data pertaining to these seismic events, and let's move on. You can see all the significant earthquakes that occurred within that 20-hour period right here on this map, starting with the 3.5, then the 4.2 struck, then the 4.1, then the 4.2 down here, and then the magnitude 5.4 out here. And you can see it all on this helicopter, and you can see how close in time all of these earthquakes did occur. Very, very odd increase in seismicity, guys. Very strange. I know they're not directly connected, but when you see an area completely calm, well, not completely calm, but somewhat calm for the longest time, and then all of a sudden you see a bunch of magnitude 4s spread out over the whole area, ends with a 5.4, and then it calms down again, it kind of makes you think that something, something, somehow, I don't know what, but they must be connected in some way, shape, or form, right? I mean, it's just, they just gotta be. Now, I do have resources on here for the USGS earthquake map for this location and time period. And remember, I'm gonna leave a link to this in the description box below, so come check all of this stuff out if you wish. All right, let's start with the magnitude 3.5 at Yellowstone. This is the location of the magnitude 3.5 and 2.04 shock in relation to the two nearest fault systems. It does not appear to have occurred on any fault system. It's possible it could have occurred on the Buffalo Fork Fault, but it doesn't really look like it from where these quakes are located. On August 15, 2019 at 1946 UTC, a magnitude 3.5 earthquake struck the southern border of Yellowstone National Park at a depth of 7.4 kilometers. This was the start of a 20-hour 20, 20 time period of increased seismicity for the U.S. and Canada. Not too many earthquakes occurred as part of this increase, but quakes did start striking in odd places with magnitudes that haven't been seen for a little while. Are all these a coincidence? You be the judge. Let's start. About 11 hours or so prior to this magnitude 3.5, a 2.0 struck just to the southeast, making me feel that this was a foreshock. The magnitude 2.0 struck at 8.9 kilometers in depth. As you can see via the map image right here, these two events did not occur on any known fault system. 
It is possible it occurred on the southern end of the Buffalo Fork Fault, however, I do not believe that's the case. A few small aftershocks no larger than magnitude 1.8 struck after the 3.5. This is also the largest earthquake to strike within the Yellowstone National Park boundary since the magnitude 3.6 near Maple Creek on July 18, 2017, just over two years. So, what caused this event, and why did it occur in such a strange location? Click here, and I have a button to see recent earthquakes at Yellowstone magnitude 3.5 and above over the past few years. You can do that if you want. Here are some plots of this event and the magnitude 2.04 shock. Pay attention to image captions and chart labels. Right here, with a 1 hertz high pass filter, is the magnitude 3.5 at 7.4 kilometers in depth, which was the largest one to occur in just over two years at Yellowstone. Going down. Three seismograms for the 3.5, each from the same exact location, excuse me, station. However, the top plot is unfiltered, the middle plot has a 1 hertz high pass filter, and the bottom plot has a 2 hertz low pass filter. Although this was not a low frequency earthquake, it sure did have some very strong lower frequencies, which seem to be stronger than the higher frequencies. Look at how strong these lower frequencies are, guys. Look at that. That's pretty crazy, in my opinion. And down here, we do have the magnitude 2.04 shock, which was barely noticeable, which struck at 8.9 kilometers in depth about 11 hours prior to the 3.5. The 2.0 struck just to the southeast of the 3.5. Magnitude 4.2 in Manhattan, Montana. Location of recent seismicity in Montana compared to the nearest fault system. The Central Park Fault, which very little is known about this fault, is either a normal slip or reverse slip fault. And down here we do see the event page right here for the 4.2 in Montana. Now Montana is no stranger to earthquakes. In fact, Montana experiences magnitude 3 and magnitude 4 events every now and then. However, something has recently changed for the Manhattan, Montana area, the area which is circled in the map right here. About four and a half hours after the 3.5 struck Yellowstone, a strong 4.2 struck Manhattan, Montana. It struck at 7.6 kilometers in depth, and over 400 people reported viewing this event. That number could be higher right now. To witness an earthquake largest, excuse me, I meant to say larger than this, for this area, or in the immediate vicinity, you would have to go all the way back to the magnitude 4.5 of August 27th, 1977. Yes, this is the strongest earthquake to hit this region since 1977. It struck to the northeast of this recent magnitude 4.2. Now the moment tensor of this event is a little sketchy, as you can see right down here. However, it looks like, and I'm no professional at all, it could be a mix of strike slip or normal faulting? I don't know, I could be wrong. Although earthquakes around this region do occur, it is notable that already three magnitude 4 plus events have struck around Manhattan, Montana since July 14th, 2019, this year. It originally started with 3.7 of February of this year, 2019, but then a 4.0 struck on July 14th. Numerous earthquakes around magnitude 2 and magnitude 3 struck afterwards, making the USGS think that they were four shocks after the original 4.0. I would have agreed with them back then. However, on August 6th, a magnitude 4.1 struck, and now this 4.2 only 10 days later? Are these all parts of possible four shocks? to a larger earthquake along the Central Park Fault, I think it is entirely possible, since it seems like seismicity and the magnitudes thereof are increasing for this area. Please click here, and I do have a button all the way down here, to visit the USGS earthquake map for seismicity in this area, magnitude 3.5 and above, since 1920. You can tell 2019 has been by far the most active year for this area near Manhattan, Montana. However, in the 1920s, there were a couple of mid-range magnitude 5s not far from Manhattan, Montana. Now, very little is known about the Central Park Fault System near Manhattan, Montana. The mapping certainty of this fault is labeled as poor, so these events very well may be related to this fault line waking up. It has a very poor surficial expression, so I doubt that we would know exactly where and how large this fault is until it fully reawakens. However, I doubt it could surpass a magnitude 6.5, if that. Below are plots of the 4.2 and its three main four shocks leading up to it. Images are in slideshow format. The strongest one you see is the 4.2. Here you have the magnitude 4.2 main shock, which I still believe could be a four shock of a larger quake. Remember, four shocks can last for years, if not a decade. 
before a major quake happens. But usually it's a few weeks, months, it all depends, really. But when force shocks do occur, they usually occur for quite a while. Uh, let's see, we got uh, one, two point something. I don't remember, two point something right there. And this was a 3.1, I believe, or something like that. Uh, you have to check the USGS earthquake map on that. Uh, but that, those are, those are the quakes, guys. There are a lot of them with very strong S wave arrivals. So that's something very interesting about these earthquakes up in Manhattan, Montana. Very strong S wave arrivals compared to other earthquakes that I've seen of similar magnitude. So, let's move on. Strange magnitude 4.1 in Saskatchewan, Canada. When do you hear of earthquakes occurring in Saskatchewan, Canada? Here's the event page. Over 12 people felt this event. Over. Remember, that's only the people that reported feeling it to USGS, and this place probably isn't even that populated. Now, to add to the strangeness and timing of this increase in seismicity, a magnitude 4.1 struck in an odd location in southeast Saskatchewan, Canada. It supposedly struck at 5 kilometers in depth, and 12 people in the area reported to USGS that they felt this event. The most recent earthquake in this area, prior to this one, was a magnitude 3.9 induced or triggered earthquake at 1 kilometers in depth on April 13th, 2018. Induced or triggered events are either caused by fracking, wastewater injection, or purposeful relief of tectonic pressure by humans. However, this area has seen some moderate seismicity since 1920, all of which occurred since 1988. <clears throat> it is likely that this area has seen an increase in seismicity due to fracking. I know people always blame fracking, and sometimes rightfully so, but this area really has seen induced and triggered events before. So why would all of these quakes occur within 20 hours, especially this magnitude 4.1 that occurred in Canada? Very strange, guys. Very strange. Right here, we do have the seismic plots of the magnitude 4.1 in Canada. P and S wave arrival and, I believe, surface waves, since the closest station was quite a distance away from this, the epicenter of this event. So, that's the event, and let's move on. Magnitude 4.2 in Kansas, which is labeled in blue, as you can see on the map image, and orange dots are the aftershocks. Going down, we do see the event page right here. Likely the felt report number is much higher as of the time I saved this image, so I'm guessing maybe around 2,000 right now or something like that. Now about 10 and a half hours after the 4.1 in Canada, a very strong 4.2 struck at 5 kilometers in depth near South Hutchinson, Kansas. Over a thousand people reported feeling this event, I bet it's even higher now, with a few reports indicating moderate to strong shaking. No building damage was reported, but minor damage to people's belongings were reported. And right here, we do have plots of the magnitude 4.2 in Kansas. Now, there were also a few aftershocks reported within just an hour of the main shock. Below are plots from the closest seismic station of the largest aftershock, which was reportedly a 3.1 at 5 kilometers in depth just to the west of the 4.2, about 10 minutes or so after. Still looked pretty strong. I believe it did have some felt reports as well. Now scrolling all the way down, let's go to the last one on the list, the magnitude 5.4 off Oregon coast, which surprisingly, three people did feel, guys. It's not too, too surprising, but... It is pretty far away from the Oregon coast, so three people did report feeling this earthquake, guys. About two hours or so after the 4.2 in Kansas, this interesting increase in seismicity came to a close with the magnitude 5.4 striking supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth off the coast of Oregon. It struck along the Blanco Fracture Zone, notably the northwestern part. Surprisingly, three people reported feeling this earthquake. If it struck along the coast, that number would be much higher. However, it is hard to feel a 5.4 that occurred as far away as it did, but regardless, a few people definitely felt it. The Blanco Fracture Zone is the epicenter of much seismicity in the past. It is a right lateral transform fault trending southeast to northwest, approximately 350 kilometers long, and actually has been the location of numerous volcanic eruptions in the past. Most earthquakes strike along the Blanco Ridge with a strike-slip style event. However, this day's magnitude 5.4 occurred far to the northwest of the Blanco Ridge. Blanco Ridge is, I believe, this right here. It's right in this location right down here. In January of 1940, 1994, I mean, an earthquake swarm intrigued scientists watching the Blanco Fracture Zone. According to wave data pertaining to these events, scientists were able to determine a volcanic eruption did occur. However, as more investigations took place, they discovered a large hydrothermal vent 
which was the first ever to be discovered along a transformed fault in the world. As this area spreads and wreaks havoc on the ocean floor, it is only common sense that magma would rise to fill the gaps. Undersea eruptions in this area do occur from time to time, likely with many going unnoticed. This magnitude 5.4 was quite strange regarding its frequency and waveform characteristics. The frequencies of this event were far lower than what I would expect. Of, of course, station KA, KEB, excuse me, in the NC network, the closest station to this event, is quite a distance away from the epicenter, so we should see some lower frequencies. However, I have seen earthquakes occurring in this location in the past that did not carry such lower frequencies compared to this event right here. Below are plots of this event from the closest seismic station, KEB, in the NC network. I have three images here in a slideshow format. The first is unfiltered, the second has a 1 hertz high pass filter, and the third has a 2 hertz low pass filter. Check out the dominant lower frequencies, guys. Right here is zoomed in and has a 1 hertz high pass filter. Let's take a look at some of the hot, little bit higher frequencies. But look at that, guys. Very strong. This is with a 2 hertz low pass filter. And look, each section from line to line, from right here to right here, is one minute. Back here, it was 30 seconds from line to line. So this is double the length. Look at those lower frequencies. Look at how far and spread out those waveform oscillations are, meaning they have very low frequencies. Pretty crazy, guys. I don't know. I think that's pretty crazy. Now, this earthquake was also strong enough to be detected many hundreds of miles away. The following is the teleseismic signature of this magnitude 5.4 from station MCID at Yellowstone. Very low frequencies, like we should see with the teleseism. And that's from the Blanco Fracture Zone, magnitude 5.4. Very intriguing. Now let's move on to my last post. All right, well, we got my Hawaii blog under the Seismic Blogs menu, and we are on my most recent post. Again, I'll leave a link to this in the description box below. If you want to skip this part of the video and just go read it yourself, that's just fine. Spasmodic Tremor, magnitude 4.5 and 3.2 near Hilo and Mauna Kea, and Growing Pond in Hali Mau Mau Crater. Well, the Big Island of Hawaii never ceases to amaze, guys. Not only are the wildlife and plants abundant in diversity, but so are the volcanoes. Many different aspects of volcanic activity continue to, uh, excuse me, continue to take place under and on the Big Island of Hawaii. Spasmodic tremor continues sporadically, though rates seem to have dropped over the past several weeks. This does occur from time to time, and magma continues to pour into the Mauna Loa Summit, Kilauea Summit, and Kilauea East Rift Zone Reservoirs. There were also two earthquakes I will quickly mention in this post. A very strange magnitude 4.5 in Hilo Bay, and a magnitude 3.2 under Mauna Kea. Also, if you haven't heard, a pond or a lake is growing at the bottom of Haui Mau Mau Crater inside of Kilauea Caldera. It is not a lava lake, but in fact a lake or pond of water. It was discovered on July 25, 2019, and was originally thought to be rainwater. However, recent studies indicate that the pond is constantly groaning, excuse me, growing, and that recent rainfall has been minimal. Basically, it appears that groundwater is intruding into the crater, seeing that rainfall has been insufficient to create a constantly growing pond. Regardless, either groundwater or rainfall could be the cause. Either could be true, but the research done by HBO points more favorably towards groundwater. This could cause explosive eruptions in the near future if certain conditions have been met. And according to USGS HBO, this type of situation has occurred at Kilauea before, but not in recorded history. And I have a picture right here of the steaming pond on August 15, 2019. Mauna Loa is currently experiencing heightened volcanic unrest, including increasing seismicity and uplift. Therefore, the alert level has been raised to advisory, and the aviation color code has been raised to yellow. Click there to keep up to date with recent alert postings from HBO. And as seen in the picture above, the bottom water, blah, 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 blah. If you want to see the Volcano Watch articles put out by HBO, click that button there. Also, if you want to monitor this pond yourself with the webcam at Kilauea, which looks into Hali Mau Mau Crater, click right here. And if you want to understand what volcanic spasmodic tremor is and how it relates to ongoing volcanic unrest in Hawaii, click here. Going down. Now click the USGS earthquake map if you wish to see all the earthquakes for this time period and location. And here's the Hawaii station map. Now spasmodic tremor has not been too prevalent as of late. However, we did see multiple small events and one large event between August 12th through August 14th. I will show the usual seismic data and audio pertaining to these events. 
Afterwards, I will quickly talk about the two recent and interesting earthquakes that struck near Hilo and Mauna Kea. Also, station WAID is a terrible station, but is one of the only short period channels in the location that I need. Lots of weaker spasmodic tremor does not appear on there, so use primarily TRAD and KKUD to confirm if something is seismic, seeing those stations are many miles apart. Below are helicorder plots in slideshow format which show all of the spasmodic tremor I will talk about today. Some are hard to see, but can be easily seen on station TRAD. However, using the seismic plots I'm about to show, you can clearly see the events on three out of four stations. That is not all spasmodic tremor. Those are background noise. That's why WAID is terrible. Here's one of the biggest ones that we have seen for a few weeks right there. All right. Here's event number one. Event one occurred on August 12, 2019 at 1245 UTC. It was minor and lasted approximately 24 minutes. Matches up on all seismic stations. Kind of hard to see on WID again. If you want to hear the seismic audio, please come to my website here. Just saying. If you want to hear that audio. And here, this one occurred on the 12th as well at 2232 UTC and lasted about 22 minutes. I, it almost didn't catch my eye, but I was able to find it. Waveforms look a little different from station to station, but you can tell it does correlate just like every other spasmodic tremor event. Cannot be seen on WAID though. WAID is having a big problem. Event 3 occurred on August 13th at 022 UTC and lasted approximately 24 minutes and started more along the lines of an earthquake. Notice that? And there we go. Event number 4. Event 4 occurred on August 14th, 2018 at 927 UTC. It was very minor and lasted approximately 27 minutes and looks to be more comprised of earthquakes than tremor. Again, you cannot see it at all on WAID because WAID sucks right now. Again, if you want the seismic audio, go to the, uh, the links in the description box below and check this out. The last event I reported on, which is the last event we've had so far, occurred on August 14, 2019 at 9.58 UTC. It was the largest event that we have seen in a few weeks and lasted approximately 29 minutes. Very obvious, obvious spasmodic tremor event, correlating perfectly on all nearby stations. Barely showing on WAID, but you can see it right here, actually. Notice that. Yep. All right. So that's it for right now. And we got two recent earthquakes, the magnitude 3.2 and magnitude 4.5. In the past few weeks, seismicity on the big island spikes and plummets periodically. However, we recently saw very two, two very interesting earthquakes, guys. Very, very intriguing. The first was a 3.2 at 18.8 kilometers in depth under the east-northeast base of Mauna Kea Volcano on August 11, 2019, below our plots uh, uh, of this event and the event page. Over 38 people reported feeling this 3.2 under Mauna Kea. And here are the plots from the closest seismic station right here. Then, on August 12, 2019, a strong magnitude 4.5 earthquake struck deep at 42 kilometers in depth inside of Hilo Bay. <clears throat> and you can see the location of that 4.5 right up there, kind of inside Hilo Bay, kind of, kind of. Uh, it was a very strange location for an earthquake of this depth. This 4.5 was the strongest earthquake on the Big Island since the magnitude 5.3 at the Hualalai Volcano on April 14, 2019. Below are plots in the event page of this event. Again, over 400 people reported feeling it, 4.5. Again, largest for a few months, guys. It's been a little while since we've seen an earthquake this large. And here is the 4.5 plot right here from the closest seismic station. All right. That's it. I'm wrapping it up, guys. Let's go back here, see if anything else occurred. Some quakes on the West Coast, nothing too, too major right now. That's pretty much it, guys, for right now. Steamboat Geyser should erupt in the next few days. And, yeah, so that's pretty much it. God bless, guys. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you later.